Let's talk tourism. Oren Marciano was born in Brooklyn, New York, where his family has decades of experience in real estate development. Oren originally studied computer engineering at Lehigh University. Go Mountain Hawks. Is that right? Uh, yeah. yeah sure. Then seeking uh -huh. a career change, he, he later on uh, moved to Costa Rica way back in 2006, where he studied and received a master's degree in wildlife management. And from there, several twists of fate led Oren and his father into business together, building and eventually managing the Los Altos Resort in Manuel Antonio. Uh, more recently, having completed a new project, Jungle Vista, when Oren's not busy as the general manager of both properties, he flies ultralights, bakes bread, and is the father of a toddler. Oren, let's talk tourism. Let's do it. Please take us back to when and how you got your start in Costa Rican tourism. To tell that story, we'll go back to my very first trip to Costa Rica, which was in 2002. Okay. We left literally two weeks after our, our graduation, university graduation, a good friend of mine and I from Brooklyn, he went to Drew University in, in New Jersey, but we had been planning the trip together since prior. Uh, we were looking to get away, adventure, travel, something new, exciting, different. Uh, we didn't really know anything about Costa Rica at the time. It was a little bit of a random choice to come down here. I was looking for something to do related to wildlife, conservation, volunteer programs. Um, I studied computer engineering at Lehigh University, but in my junior year, went and spent a semester abroad in Australia and got really turned on to just being out in nature. And uh, eventually that led to more thoughts of conservation needs. Uh, having grown up in Brooklyn, you're not too exposed to nature, but once I once I had that opportunity, it really opened my eyes. And when we were done, you know, planning our, our post-graduation trip, I figured I wanted to do something related to nature conservation, put that into Google and everything that came up was Costa Rica. So that's how we ended up coming to Costa Rica. And on that first trip here, while we were here, we were here for two and a half months <clears throat> in total, my parents, brother and sister decided to come down and travel with us at the end of our trip. So that was in August, 2002. And we were in Memo Antonio at the time with my, with my parents, with my family. We all went to the national park. My dad said, oh, I'm not gonna go with you guys today to the national park. I'm gonna walk around and see what I see. Came across a real estate office in Memo Antonio, thought maybe he'd find a little property to build a family vacation home for us to come down to. He really had been enjoying his trip. Um, but the real estate broker probably saw more opportunity when he found out he was a real estate developer and showed him the property that eventually became Los Altos which was obviously much bigger and had more potential. He had the vision, I would say pretty early on of what it could be. Um, and he came back shortly afterwards with his partner at the time, they purchased the property and started planning to do what would be mostly a, a condo project, which is what they knew from their work together in New York. Um, and they started construction 2006 going forward 2007, 2008, things started getting shaky. You know, by 2008, I think they were pretty sure that the economy was, was changing, that the real estate market was changing. Probably sometime around 2000, end 2008, early 2009, they realized that the original business model of selling the condos was not going to be the same once they were finished with the project and that they better think of a use for these condos. And they decided to put together a hotel operation, a full hotel operation and hired local, you know, a local manager to start putting that together. Um, the crisis got worse. In 2010, the manager left for, for very reason, let's say, kind of just left the project on very short notice. And I had just finished my master's degree, which I had been studying since 2006. Uh, I had moved to Costa Rica myself in 2006, full-time to do the master's degree you had mentioned. And in 2010, I had just finished my master's degree probably two weeks before the manager up and left on us without prior notice. And my dad asked me to step in and at least see what was going on while he was dealing with the crisis in New York City. And that's kind of, that, that's, that's how I got my start directly in tourism. It wasn't my original plan. I had studied wildlife conservation with the intentions of working in that field. But as you mentioned, the way things worked out, I ended up joining my dad uh, at that time and have stuck around ever since. So that's basically 10, 10 years, yeah. 10 years now. Uh, the first year and a half or so, I was 
getting my feet wet, learning, learning the ropes. And about a year, year and a half into it, I took over formally as the general manager of the Badgers. So if you could go all the way back, 10 years back, and give yourself some advice, what would it have been? Pay more attention to the uh, labor regulations, I would say. That's an interesting one to start off with. There's several things I could say, but one of the biggest things I learned that was hard to learn, I would say, it took a long time, was really the importance of being very organized and understanding all the labor laws and spending more effort and time on human resources in general. Um, partially, I would say, because of my lack of prior experience managing businesses and also, you know, coming from the U.S., our labor laws are quite different than they are here in, in Costa Rica. And here, it's a very important part of running a successful business, I think, is a good management of human resources. So it took me quite a long time to really understand how important that all is. Particularly um, in, in hospitality, right? In, in normal pre-pandemic times, about how many full-time employees or collaborators are there at Los Altos? Between the two hotels, because we actually share the staff amongst both hotels, since they're very close to each other, about 65 or so prior to the pandemic. And do you have a full-time HR or, or managerial type person who's just handling? No, no. I mean, for many years, we didn't even have an operations manager. So I was kind of doing it all, which was really not, maybe with someone with enough experience and you know, who had set everything up well from the beginning could pull it off. But really, I found it overwhelming to manage all of that. Right. So our first goal was to hire a operations manager, someone with good experience in, in operations, which was a big help to take that off of my table, you know, take, take that off the table for me. Um, but we still don't have, and I would say it's, it's partially because the size of our business still wouldn't justify a full-time human resources professional. So we have people who do human resources functions within the company, um, but not at the level that could potentially manage that themselves. So it still falls to me and the operations manager, but we've spent a lot of time organizing ourselves in terms of, you know, contracts and documents and learning the labor law well and understanding, you know, how to handle these issues. And that has certainly helped over the years to get better outcomes. Mm -hmm. In addition to labor, is there anything else as you got your feet wet in the industry that was really a surprise to you? Uh, I would say also the other big surprise was, especially for, for a business like Los Altos, which I think still um, can benefit greatly from travel agency relationships, as opposed to maybe some other mid-market hotels, or I'm not sure, but I know for sure in our case, uh, it has been a very worthwhile investment over the years to build up those relationships. It's something I did not expect going into tourism starting off in, in tourism, how important and how involved creating those travel agency relationships are and how much benefit they can actually give you once you put in the time, effort, and invest the, the resources necessary to do that. So marketing was probably the other big area that I didn't really appreciate before going into, and it took time to really see it. And I'd say that's something you always continue to learn um, as time goes by. There's always more opportunities there, and we're still starting to do new things that we haven't done in the past in terms of, of starting to look more out into the international market, for example, you know, it's something we only started in recent years, sending out representatives to trade shows outside of Costa Rica. So that was probably one of the other biggest learning experiences that I've had in tourism was how complex the marketing and sales chain is itself, you know, from the actual traveler that shows up at your front desk, how he got there, you know, there's a lot of moving pieces. Some people might book directly through Expedia, but I would say our most valuable customers are often the ones that come to travel agents. And the complexity of that whole industry was eye-opening to me in the sense that I didn't expect it to work that way. And I think if you don't work in it directly, you wouldn't expect it to work that way and, and realize how many pieces there are. I went to the Focus Right con uh, conference yeah. a handful of years ago. That's basically you know, the bigger tech travel players. And I met a... a, a a handful of guys who were doing the all of the travel booking for a public German television channel. And it was a gigantic business. And it, and it, it reminded me of what somebody told me once. Uh, this whole travel ecosystem is an ocean. 
I mean, it's just so much bigger than, than most people understand. And it's way too complex for one person to wrap their head around. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And, uh, that was, that was definitely a, uh, an eye opener, I would say. And, and I'm still learning, as I mentioned, you know, I'm still turning over new, you know, new opening new doors, let's say, and learning of new opportunities. And, and, uh, you know, through the recent pandemic, we've had the, let's say, need and then opportunity to really focus on the national market, something we haven't done as much in the past. And it's a whole new world of how to market yourself to the locals, very different than what we have been doing up until now. So there's always more to learn in that area. You know, we've all, I think, been a little bit jaded on the, the notion that, that the domestic market could move much. But I think while Costa Rica basically was marooned and no one could leave, you, you forget that in the last two, three decades, upper middle class has done extremely well in Costa Rica and, and, and uh, they've traveled and they've got good taste and they appreciate good stuff. Yeah, and there's a lot of great product here in Costa Rica. So it was a nice opportunity, I think, for both sides in a sense to introduce ourselves to each other. It'd be say. interesting to see if that sticks. Yeah, I'm hoping now that we've made such an effort, we've put so much resources into building out, you know, our contacts, databases, et cetera, for locals and, and, and building up our name locally, that we'll find a way to maintain that relationship going forward, maintain those, those connections going forward. That leads me to my next question, which is what sort of post-pandemic travel patterns, tendencies do you see changing? Changing? Um... My gut feeling is that if, you know, the health outcomes are positive and that we more or less go back to normal life within, let's say, 12, 18 months, you know, over, worldwide in, in, in the majority of, you know, of, of, of our, our life aspects, for example, that I think people will travel similarly to they have in the past, especially in the market that I'm working in. Um, I think that a property like Los Altos, whose inventory is our, our three, bed, three and four bedroom condos, I mean, in my mind, I'm definitely planning on promoting that as a, as a positive, not only because it's extra space, but now that you have all of that room to yourself with you and your family, you kind of have that extra level of privacy. But my gut today is that, you know, humans, we are easy to forget and, as things kind of go back to normal, I feel like most likely people will look for similar things that they have in the past um, and, and, you know, have similar expectations that they've had in the past. Everyone talks about now how everyone is going to be worried about disinfection going forward. I mean, I, I don't think that that's going to stick around forever unless there's a constant actual need for it. But if we eventually get to the point where this specific coronavirus is more or less behind us and we're just waiting to see when the next one shows up, that, you know, people are not going to be as obsessed with disinfection. You know, they're not going to be worried about, oh, are you disinfecting every soup, you know, you know, superficie. Here's my <laughs> Spanish coming up into my English, every, every surface. I'm with you, you know, as much on that as front. Do you think those people are really going to get on a plane? The ones that are that worried about it? Oh, worried. Yeah, I mean, the ones who are so extreme that they'll still be worried about it, maybe not. Um, yeah. There could be some people who say, you know what, I won't do international travel anymore. But I feel like the draw of international travel is too is too attractive. You know, I feel like people with the resources, let's say, and this, you know, there's there's travel for every budget in a, in a sense. You know, people who have the ability to do it will be drawn to it. You know, it's just that idea of exploration and and the fact that the world. I I would say this is something that I've noticed as, as part of what made the coronavirus so such a large impact is that travel is so easy now and relatively inexpensive, you know, unless there's going to be a major price shifts, but relatively inexpensive to get around if you know how to look for the right deals, the right timing, et cetera, that that is only going to grow. I feel that that's going to continue to grow once we kind of recover, that's going to continue to grow. The, I, the idea, I mean, I know myself, I'm looking forward to my next international trip too. living in a place like Costa Rica. You still want to see something new, you know, you always want to see something new. And I think that will continue. What may happen is a certain consolidation of, of, of the industry in a sense, you know, maybe there'll be businesses that don't recover, maybe some larger players will be able to take over part of, you know, certain niches in the market. 
I didn't see that happen that much in Costa Rica, as I might have thought several months ago. You know, I haven't heard of many businesses going completely out of business in Menlo Antonio, for example, which is the market I know the best. I would have thought that that might have happened more, you know. Um, so maybe those types of things might change somewhat. I feel like, you know, the, the, the players who are, are around today who were best able to adapt will have a certain advantage when things come back to normal too. So that may shift things around who does what in the future. But I think from the traveler perspective, I would expect travelers to be similar going forward as they have been in, in the past. You've been coming down here a long time. I mean, basically 20 years, right? As traveler, student, then eventually working. What else have you seen change dramatically here in, in two decades? I would say the pace of expansion has continued, <clears throat> you know, um, in spite of the 2008 to 2010 crisis. I would say relatively shortly after that, I felt like Costa Rica recovered its, its footing and growth has continued <clears throat> pretty consistently, I would say throughout the country, you know, it's impresses me the appetite for you know, new investment here in Costa Rica. People are always thinking, oh, I'm going to build a new hotel. There's still, there's still demand out there, you know? <laughs> and it seems to a certain extent that has been the case because you're not hearing of major projects who've overshot, you know, in that sense that have built out so much and now they're regretting it. I would say that has, has been a little surprising to me, but I have continued to see that change over the past 20 years. When I came here 20 years ago, <clears throat> maybe Manuel Antonio, you haven't seen it as much because Manuel Antonio is a little bit limited. It's kind of like New York City in the sense that the land itself is quite limited. So yeah. there's only so much you can actually build in Menlo Antonio. And I think the government is a little stricter in terms of environmental permits, et cetera, in Menlo Antonio than in other areas, it seems to me. Um, <clears throat> but you look at places like Paco, Tamarindo. When I visited Costa Rica in 2002, we went to Tamarindo and I came back to Tamarindo. I think the next time that I went back to Tamarindo might have been in 2011. And I didn't recognize it. I said, oh, have I been here or not? I couldn't tell until I got to that one little roundabout, you know, that was the only holdover from the old days. So I recognized this one yeah. particular block, yeah. you know? So that was, was quite a surprise to me. So the, the, the amount of growth over the past 20 years, I think has been, has been impressive in a sense. But I would say that Costa Rica has been able to maintain still that kind of more boutique independent operator feel. I don't spend as much time in Guanacaste myself, and I know that's where more of the larger projects are are, are located. <clears throat> but I feel like whatever they have, you know, whatever larger projects have come in, by no means have they overwhelmed Costa Rica, and by no means have they become the dominant force here. So um, I would say that that's been an interesting thing to see as well. That despite, in spite of so much growth, I think it has still retained that that character. Well, you kind um, of uh, you segue to my next question, which is. What do you hope never changes or never gets lost? I think that would be one of the main things I hope never changes, never gets lost. I would, I would be very sad to see Costa Rica taken over by, you know, the same type of chains you would see in other big, you know, Mexican resort towns, Caribbean yeah. resort areas. Uh, I think that would be, that would be terrible. I think that's one of Costa Rica's best, um, you know, positive features, best aspects as from the perspective of a tourist is the fact that you have that, you know. Um, one of the things I always like to promote about Menlo Antonio is that you're in a real town. You, know, you could walk out your hotel, walk up and down the streets and you're in a little real town that you can enjoy, you know. Um, and, you know, I think something I wouldn't expect to change, but, you know, Costa Rica, and I wouldn't want to change either. Costa Ricans by their nature are very, very adept at tourism, let's put it that way. You know, they're excellent at, at providing tourism for, for foreigners. And that natural, you know, uh, ability, I would hope never changes either, right? That, that it's just part of their nature here to be very welcoming and, and enjoyable people, so. Very gracious. You know, yeah. I've, I've been dying to ask you this question. Uh, I'm fortunate to have some New Yorker friends that I've been able to visit and stay in touch with over the last 25 years. Um, and watching that explosive growth, particularly in your native Brooklyn, you know, has not been without its controversy in terms of gentrification. And so, oh, it lost its grittiness and where did the artists go and blah, blah, blah. What, where do you see some parallels or lessons that Costa Rica can learn good, bad, and ugly about 
There certainly are things that Brooklyn has done awesome. And I'm sure there's some parts of the old Brooklyn of your childhood you miss. What is there something that might be applicable down here? It's an interesting question. Um, Brooklyn has changed significantly, as you said, uh, since I grew up. I was born in Brooklyn, born and raised there. <clears throat> I was born in 1980, so I would say almost you know through the 80s and almost through all of the 90s, Brooklyn was a, still a rough place. Literally, was really. A rough place. My memories in childhood in Brooklyn um, are positive in the sense that we had a lot of fun. You know, I enjoyed my my childhood. We definitely had fun playing, you know, playing in the streets, basketball, football, that kind of stuff. But at the same time, there are memories of like, you know, me and my friends are always on the lookout. You know, whenever you're on the streets on your own as kids, you got to look out for 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 someone who's going to come and look to cause some trouble. And it was real. You know, that was a real concern and. You know, it's funny, my wife kind of laughs at me a little today because when I get back to Brooklyn, I kind of get those, you know, my ears perk up a little and, and I'm looking around and, and she laughs at me. I said, but, you know, this is just my instinct, you know, I can't help it. And um, my neighborhood in particular, you know, the neighborhood I grew up in, Brooklyn in particular, has gone through a lot of changes, I would say. There's, you would call it gentrification to a certain extent. Uh, so on the positive, well, you know, the positive side, there's so many new businesses on the street that's right around the corner from us where <clears throat> when I grew up that street was full of you know corner grocery stores and 99 cent stores and like takeout Chinese and those types of businesses and now it's full of you know all sorts of restaurants and <clears throat> gourmet shops and all that kind of stuff so that's certainly in that sense something positive I would say having access to those types of amenities close by but at the same time, I feel almost feel like a stranger in my own neighborhood, you know, whereas when I grew up, you kind of knew who was from the neighborhood. And if anyone came to visit from outside, you would say, oh, okay. I'm sorry, Casey, I gotta, maybe we can, we can. No worries. <laughs> Listen, let's wrap it up. I saw your assistant back yeah. there. Uh, yeah. Last, qu last question, where are you traveling to next? Do you have your first post pandemic trip planned? You know, I turned 40 this year, just a month ago in December. Congrats. and. <clears throat> We had been thinking, my, my family and I, of traveling to Italy. That was our plan, you know, oh, nice. for all the pandemic. Was to head and do a trip to Italy, which, you know, for, for all the food and all the sites there. And, of course, we couldn't do it. So, well, I may do a quick trip back home to New York in terms of, you know, once it's safe to travel and go and visit home. I think our, our first trip as a family, hopefully, will be that trip to Italy that we weren't able to take this year. Any particular part? Um... No, no, not yet. We haven't, we hadn't gotten to that point yet. And I would leave it open at this point. And see, awesome. See well, listen, Orin, it's always fun talking to you. Go take care of the boss man over there before he gets mad at you. Yeah, Casey, thank you so much. Sorry for cutting thank a little you. short. Hey, I appreciate all your time. Have a great day. Yeah, you too. Thank you very much. I hope to talk to you soon. Take care. Let's talk tourism.